So what I will do is I will speak for 40 minutes till it comes up to the hour, to the full hour, and then I'll take a break and we can assess the uh, uh, we can assess, assess the the mood because the the presentation that I have is quite a lengthy one. So the topic of today is price action, and that falls into several categories. I have I want to talk about day trading in the context of uh, I, I want to talk about price action in the context of day trading, and I also want to talk about scalping, and I th I think those two they can support each other in your understanding of price action. And I also want to talk about patterns that are pertaining to the day of the week. One of the, the, the patterns that was incredibly beneficial for me last year and in the past has, is, is, is the pattern in stock indices, whereby if during the Friday's trading session, the normal trading session where the stocks are traded, if during that session, the market is incapable of getting above the highs of the previous day, i.e. if Friday's high is lower than Thursday's high, then I researched that 10 years back. So, you know, 10 years of 52 weeks of trading, so 520 samples. Now it's not every single one of those samples that will have that particular pattern. But when it did happen, when you Friday was lower than Thursday's high in an index like the S&P 500 and in the Dow Jones index, of all the samples that I found, 95% of those produced lower prices on a Monday. So I want to take you through that as well because I think things like that could be incredibly beneficial when you're swing trading. So much of the material that I will be presenting to you, and by the way, you'll see me turn my head this way. That's because I will have open positions going on right now. I am, I am short the the, the Nasdaq. Um, I wonder if I could. I imagine that I can. I wonder if I can show it. Anyway, I am I'm short the Nasdaq, and it's it's going very well. I'm I'm incredibly bearish the market, and that has cost me a fair bit. I actually lost money in January because I pursued the short side. And um, well, so far February has started well, but uh, you know, <laughs> the month is still young. What I wanna talk about is price action in the context of stock indices. That's not to say that you can't use this for foreign exchange or commodities, but I focus a much of my time on stock indices, which I find easier to trade. What you're seeing here is a graphical uh, representation of the percentage gain or the percentage loss from the Dow Jones index over the last 30 years. So what this means is that uh, the vast majority of, of, of trading days will oscillate around you know, a small gain for the day or a small loss for the day. And then you'll have the outlier days, like not that 1987 is, is on this, but for example, during the 90s and the crisis of 2008 and 9, you had some horrific down days in the Dow Jones index. And, and likewise, during the good days, often in bear markets, when you have the snapback rallies, you'll have some tremendous good days. But what's interesting about these 7,500 observations is that they're more or less split down the middle. And what that should tell you is that when you're trading a starting stock index, when you're looking at the Dow Jones index over the last 30 years or seven and a half thousand observations, you'll find that that 50.6% of all trading days in the Dow Jones index finished in plus and 49.4% of all trading days finished in minus. So even though that the Dow Jones has grown tremendously over the last 30 years or the last seven and a half thousand trading days, the outcome of any given individual day is 50-50. When the trading day starts from, a, from the point of view of uh, being in a bull trend or being in a bear trend, bull market, bear market, the, the, the percentage chance of the odds of the Dow closing up for the day 
or closing down for the day. And this obviously also applies to the S&P 500 because of its direct correlation with the Dow Jones index is 50-50. And that's an advantage to us because then when we go into the trading day, we may as day traders be somewhat biased of what has been going on yesterday, the day before. But the reality is, irrespectively of the day before, the two days before or being a bull trend or being a bear trend, the odds of the market closing either down for the day or up for the day is 50-50. Now, when I, when I, it says here my teaching style, but what it could also say is my training style. Um, I am, uh, when I give a presentation like this on a, via web seminar or in person at a conference or a show, I notice that other speakers will often show you the full picture. So they will show you the full chart and then they will say, and I sold there, or I covered my short position there or I sold short there, and then they'll explain to you why. Uh, my job, I feel, is not to act as a disservice to you. I don't believe that that way of giving a speech or training or even training myself is particularly conducive to efficient training. My, my job that I see it here is to, I, I see myself as making you aware of things on a screen. My job is to point things out to you. But if I point that out to you with the benefit of hindsight, i.e. if I told you, and that's why I'm selling short here. Well, your eyes are deceiving machines and they will already see what comes next. So you will almost invariably uh, go to the, to the cheat sheet, which is the rest of the chart. But that's not my job. My job is to train your eyes and make sure that you're not giving the answers. So I'm going to train you in a, an entirely different way where you don't get the answer to the outcome. And that means that that puts an incredible strain on your eyes, not physically, but mentally. But through that strain, you're also building new neural pathways to seeing the market in a different light. Now, I want to ask you a question. Depending on the broker that you're trading with, you can go to virtually any broker's official website and you will see that their risk disclaimers will state that 79, 80% of all their clients are losing money. So I just grabbed a couple of, uh, a, a couple of brokers risk disclaimers. This one is 79.6%, this one is 79%. But here's the thing, this seems to be the norm. It's normal that people lose. It's one of the reasons why uh, trading is in the limelight of many uh, regulators and legislators because they feel that trading is akin to gambling and that many being led down the garden path without really having a fighting chance of making money in trading. So what I wanna ask you is, can we use this information to our advantage? Because it seems to me that this is the norm. Losing money in the market is the norm. This is normal. So I like to ask you, well, what's not normal? What do the 80% continuously do? What do the 90% continuously do? And, and what do the 10% that aren't losing, what are they doing? Because it seems to me that normal human behavior can be directly attributed to the large percentage of losses that we are seeing in the trading industry. So show me the face of not normal because if this had been a school and the school had a failure rate of 80, 90%, this school wouldn't be in business for very long. I think we can agree on that. So why is this industry so cursed? Why is it that trading is so fraught with difficulties? Is it because of the markets? Is it because of the 
information that is at our disposal, or is it something entirely different? And there's no shortage of information available to us. Absolutely, you, you, could, you could spend yourself a fortune on trading courses, on trading information, on trading books, on tutoring, etc. And having spent all that money, you could be every bit as close or every bit as far away from successful trading as you'll ever be. Because the sad truth is that the more that we engage in books or on talks and courses, the less we are likely to give the necessary contemplation to what the real problem to trading is. And the sad truth is that many educators globally are no better traders than you are. They haven't cracked any kind of code because there isn't a code to crack. They're, they're, and, and I'm hoping that by you inviting me to give you this talk, that I would be able to give you a different perspective to what trading can be all about. Because if everyone is engaging in this kind of purchasing cheap courses and expensive courses and courses and engaging in price action and engaging in Fibonacci and engaging in MACD and RSI, etc., etc., etc. If we're all engaged in the same thing and the vast majority of us are losing money anyway, then it stands to reason, logically, I feel, that maybe the answer is not found in the in the tools that we're using the human tendency is to believe uh, anything that gives us comfort and deny anything that gives us discomfort and that's the way our brain is put together we want to avoid uh, discomfort and we want to embrace pleasure and i've tried to illustrate that with some funny cartoons What spending 10 years on a trading desk taught me was that many people uh, love to find a place in a downtrend and buy it. So if the market is trending lower, it seems to be in our it seems to be in our DNA that we prefer to buy something that is falling because it gives us the uh, impression of it being cheap. But what's so perverse? about the industry that we are conducting ourselves in is that, wow, the market is falling. This is brilliant. It's what I like. When you're short, you're happy when you see the markets fall. We seem to be attracted to things that are on offer. If you go to the supermarket on a Saturday morning to do your shopping, the supermarket knows that in order to attract the likelihood of of you going through their particular set of doors as opposed to another supermarket is to make things cheap for you. So they will they will try and lure you with a special two for one uh, or if you or half price so and so. It's perfectly natural. It's just the way that the human mind works. But what I observed over the 10 years on the trading floor uh, observing people trading was that when the market was falling, they liked to be the one that stuck their hand out and tried to grab that proverbial falling knife. And it was sad to see because many people actually failed to make money using this strategy. Um, another thing that people love to do was they love to take part profits. Now, th the thing about taking part profits, say that you have shorted uh, the market at 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 90 and the market is now trading at 80 and 70 and 60 and you're beginning to you're beginning to feel a little bit uncomfortable because the profits are racking up and so in order to uh, uh, appease your troubled mind and your troubled soul you will begin to take parts of the position off now you may not have a particular reason for doing so or not one that you that you consciously understand but subconsciously your mind is trying to um, negotiate with your logic. It tries to negotiate with you saying, well, look, if you take half off, at least you've locked in that profit. Now, am I saying that there's anything wrong with that? Yes, I do. 
because this is what the 80, 90% of people are doing. And what I need you to understand is that if you want to be a profitable trader, a successful trader that makes a lot of money trading, unfortunately, you need to hold a mirror up and say, well, am I the 10% or am I the 90%? And if you engage in that kind of behavior, you are invariably belonging to the 90% group. But if you don't engage in that behavior, at least not, we can all have that moment in time where we feel I have, to got, I have got to take some profit home. We're not talking about what we do every now and then. We're not talking about an anecdote. We're, doing what, we're talking about what we tend to continuously do if, if we can continuously provoke a behavior in ourselves where we are not tempted to try and, 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 and uh, buy something that's falling, and rather we are thinking, well, it's falling, maybe I should sell short. And if we could stop trying to take partial profits, well, then you're beginning to act like the 10%. You may not be rewarded for it immediately, but over time, you need to trust me that you will. Another and final behavior trait that I wanted to discuss with you is that one of the things that Larry Pesavento taught me was, and he's probably going to say, oh, you're giving me too much credit, but I don't think you can give someone like that too much credit. Him and another gentleman called Dr. David Paul taught me the value of adding to winning positions. Now, adding to a winning position is a particularly difficult segment of trading, especially day trading, where our time frame tends to be quite short and narrow. Adding to a winning position is much easier. If, for example, you're an investor, you buy a share at, at 100, and it goes to, a, to 150, where well, you buy a few more shares. That's adding to a winning position. But most people get that back to front, they will add to a, a losing position. Over the 10 years that I spent on a trading floor observing about 50,000 people, 50,000 retail accounts, I could probably count on one hand the amount of people that added to a winning position. Whilst the behavior of adding to a losing position, well, pretty much everyone else added to losing positions. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and be holier than thou and say I've never added to a losing position because of course I have. I'm a human being. And I am not going to say that I always add to my winning positions because I don't. It's also a a question of well, what is my mood on this particular day? If I was a robot, I would probably always add, but we're not robots. We are human beings. So are aspiring traders so different to say people who want to lose weight? You know, we, we have the, uh, the overweight individual that will then go through a transformation, at least hope for it, uh, but very often tends to, after the transformation, to go back to where they were. And it's a little bit like that we are learning about trading, we're doing well, and we have transformed ourselves, but then we go back to our old behavior and so, which is akin to putting on the weight again. So now we feel that we need to buy more books, more courses. We need to change systems. We need to engage in GAN, Bollinger Bands, Fibonacci, etc. Which is akin to people swapping from Atkins diet to Slimming World to Weight Watchers to whatever it may be. And a, a, a little personal story here. When COVID-19 broke some year ago, wow, it's been a long time when COVID-19 broke, one of the early uh, warning signs, whether you would catch the disease or not, was whether you, you were overweight or not. And it, uh, at least it was publicly informed to us that if you were overweight and you had a weight problem, you were more likely to be harder hit by COVID-19. So I set in motion a, uh, a, a regimen to losing weight because I was, at least from a, a conventional framework i was overweight i'm not so sure that i perhaps was as overweight as the as the scale suggested because i'm, I'm tall and and muscle tend uh, muscles weigh more than fat but nevertheless 
I lost about 12 kilos, which is about 24 pounds. And the way I did that was not in that in that crash slimming, you know, p- p- pursuing a uh, a particular diet like Atkins or keto or whatever they are called, but actually understanding, well, what do I need to do in order to lose weight? And I approached trading from the same vantage point. I said, well, what do I need to do to understand trading? What do I need to do to be a successful trader? Well, one of the things that I need to understand is that you can't expect to win every single day. And if you think that trading is linear, i.e. that you can simply tap a line thinking, well, I'm going to make I'm going to make $100 every single day or whatever it may be. Well, then you're doomed for failure because you're not going to just win a $100 a day. Some days the market will give you thousands and thousands of dollars if you will let it. And some days you couldn't organize a, a, a knees up in a brewery, i.e. everything you hit just goes wrong. But if you are aware of the randomness of your rewards in trading, your job will then circulate around, oscillate around you simply following the same procedure, irrespectively of the outcome. You see, that's the best that we can do. The late Mark Douglas, he was a great advocate at, look, you need to stick to your strategy come, come rainy days or, or sunshine days, because that's what's the hallmark of a winning trader is. Now, I know this is about price action and, and, don't, and, and don't worry, I haven't come, forgotten about this. We're, we're getting to that now, but it's so important that you understand that trading is so much more than charts, because if it was just about charts, everyone would win in trading. Now, what I wanna to talk to you about now is the deception of charts, because your eyes, they will seek out the information that confirms the fact that you are seeking or the bias that you have already established for yourself. So if you are negative the market, well, you're going to gravitate towards or your eyes will seek out the things that confirm the negative bias. So let me give you an example here. Here you have a a downward sloping trend, you have a series of lower highs, but when you connect the lower highs, you have a beautiful looking trend line. Now, imagine that you are sitting doing all your research and you're concluding, wow, isn't this amazing? This has got to be the easiest way in the world to make money. Look at this. The market, I simply draw a simple trend line from these series of lower highs and I project that out in the future. And at that point where the market goes above my trend line, I enter into a purchase order and look at the result. I mean, this is like a money machine, isn't it? That's the deception of eyes because what your eyes haven't picked out from this simple chart is that you also have a very simple trend line connecting this high with this lower high with this lower high. And here you also have a trend line break, but your eyes didn't pick that out for you. And the reason why it didn't do that is because it could see that this didn't confirm with the bias that you had. So here you want to be a buyer and you want to believe that trend lines are working. But if, if, if you don't do your homework and you're not aware of how your eyes are deceiving you, then you're going, to f- you're going to base your trading strategy on a false premise. And we really don't want to be there. Trend lines always look easy and compelling after the fact. And I'm not disputing the appeal of trend lines, not at all. But I'll tell you this, trend lines don't work much more than 55, 60% of the time. Anyway, that means that if you execute 100 trades, you're going to have 60 good trades and you'll be happy with that. But are you mentally equipped to deal with the 40%? Because what I noticed in my 10 years on a trading floor is that people are perfectly capable of having a trading strategy that produces more winning trades than losing trades. Easy. Virtually every single client won more frequently than they lost. Yet, overall, almost all of them were losing traders. So you need to get a a completely new appreciation for how important it is to lose well. I wrote an article about this, uh, which I'm more than happy to give to you if you email me. It's called best loser wins. The man or woman who takes the losses the best 
is going to be the one that run away with the price at the end. It's a 5,000 word uh, piece of article, so I can't just you know dish it out to you. Uh, you need to read it for yourself, but I, I hope you will. So with all this in mind, having spent 20 minutes just talking about psychology, I don't want to show you one completed chart after the other. So let's make it difficult. Let's make this a, an exercise in truly training our eyes to see what's going on in the market. And this quote here, you can read it in your own time, but uh, it's a particular beautiful quote about how we as human beings tend to avoid uh, heartache, even though it's probably the one thing that shapes us better than anything else. See here, you don't know what the answer is. Now you have to deal with it bar, la, bar by bar, just like you would when you're sat in front of the computer and the screen during a trading day. Starting from the first candle, we have a series of candles here. They're all bull candles. Candle one, two, three, four, five. Well, one, two, three, four bullish candles. Then on candle five, we actually fail above the, the, the prior bars high and the market falls back a bit. But bar five and six don't look particularly ominous. It's not until that we look at bar number seven. When I see bar number seven, there's certain things about bar number seven that suggest to me, this is uh, the, the, the tune of the music has changed. First of all, the length of the bar is significantly longer than the prior bars. It's even longer than this very bullish bar that we see here on bar number four. The second thing I notice is that there's virtually no tail. There's virtually no wig on the bar. That means that during this time frame here, there was an uniformity in the market. The sellers pressed the market all the way down to the close of this bar. Now, when we're price action traders, it's in, I can hear someone, uh, are we taking a break or is everything okay? Everything oh. fine here, Tom. Okay, all right, it was just that all of a sudden I heard something. Uh, okay, I'll carry on for another eight minutes, then we can just assess the situation. Does that sound good, Sharif? Perfect. Okay. Perfect, perfect, Tom. Okay. So bar number seven closes at its lows, but it's so incredibly important when we are price action traders that we have context. We need to take context in mind. So what do you do in this scenario? What is context in this scenario? Well, this, this bar that we're seeing here, this is a five minute bar. Let's go and look at what happens on the daily bar. Here you see the DAX being a downtrend, pulls back for three days, another eight days down, go up, down, down here, it actually makes a higher low. That gets confirmed once we take out the prior, the prior tops high. So this sets in motion a new uptrend. Up here, we have a very steady uptrend and then we have a big push up, we have a double top, we have a failed attempt above this top here. And now we have a very, very negative bar and we now have a three days counter trend. So this number that you're seeing here is gonna be important. It's 11,270. This is what we saw here. This bar number five has a price level of 11,270. So that's where we are right now. So now we have the context. The context is that we've been in an uptrend. We had a very sharp reaction down. Technically speaking, this shouldn't change the course of the trend. It should actually still be upwards. But let's have a look. Now, before we carry on, there's something that I want to bring to your attention. When you are looking at a chart, you will most likely be using your broker's chart, and that's absolutely fine. But that does present a problem, and I want to show you what this problem is. Here you're seeing DAX for the last five days. So if they, I, can, I can hear someone having their microphone on. Is there any way that we could turn that off? What you're seeing here is the DAX simply during the trading day from uh, European time, eight o'clock in the morning till 4.30. This is when the stock market is open. 
and at 4.30 it closes and then it reopens the day after. But many brokers, almost all brokers, they will have a 24-hour service. So what you're seeing here in yellow is what happens outside of the market opening hours. And you can see how if you are taking what's going on in the yellow into consideration during the trading day, you may actually get a false picture of what has been going on. You may be swayed one way or another. I'm not arguing that this is always the case, but I'm saying please be mindful that a stock market is open from 8 till 4.30 or in the Europe, it's open from 2.30 in the afternoon till 9 o'clock at night for the US markets. But what happens outside of the market hours, you need to be a little careful when you're looking at the chart because your broker chart will have that in uh, on display as well. Okay, so now we got the context. The context is that the market has been trending up But with a reversal bar like this, what do you think that you would do now? I'll give you 10 seconds just to consider what you as a trader would do. A, a bar like bar number seven up here, to me, is what I call an extended bar. An extended bar is a bar that is longer than the prior bars. And in particular, a good extended bar is one that closes right at its low or the flip side, right at its high. When I see a, an extended bar like this one, this issues a sell signal for me. This means that I need to find a place to sell short. So let's, what I, apparently before the, the, the sound went, what I've asked you to do is, what do you think is going to happen from here? What would you do if you were confronted with this pattern. The following bars shows the beginning of a downtrend. In any given downtrend, you will see counter bars. So here you see a counter trend bar, here you see a counter trend bar. Well, what's important here is that none of these counter trend bars are going above a prior bar. And in particular, and listen very closely now, that it doesn't close above a prior bar. From my point of view, as a price action trader, I find it invaluable to notice when a prior bar's high is being exceeded by the current bar. So when you're looking at this series of bars here, at what point do you see the current bar closing above the prior bar? You don't see that until here. This is the first example over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 bars that the market manages to close above a prior bars high. This often sets in motion in, in, in terms of a, a, a downtrend, a, a series of short covering bars. So when you are confronted with this current chart here, what would you do? While you're thinking about that, let me, uh, let me tell you something. To trade well, to make money from trading, you need to have a mindset that enables you to read a chart without emotion. It, it's no good that you are reading a chart and you get a sensation of fear or excitement in your stomach because you are afraid of missing out or you're getting assignment shock. It's okay to be exciting, but uh, excited. But you're actually better off if you can look at a chart completely rational and cool as a cucumber and simply just reflect on both sides of the equation. I think that I think it's incredibly important to have a trading philosophy that you are true to when you are trading. I call it a guiding principle how you want to trade. Are you the kind of person that will try to make money every single day? Or are you the kind of person who will go for that one every uh, one day, every every five, where there's a trend day and you are adding to the position all the way up or adding to the position all the way down? Uh, 
I'm I'm not the, the person to tell you what your trading philosophy should be. But if I was confronted with a chart like this, then I would say I would like to short this market. The reason why I would like to short this market is, and of course, you can accuse me of knowing what happens next. And that's absolutely true. But what I'm trying to do here is to train you one bar at a time. And I don't see anything here that suggests that the trend has changed. That means that any counter trend move is an opportunity for me to sell short. Now, this is this what you're seeing right here is the reason why I have lost money in the month of January. Because every single time that market had fallen hard and it made a, a, a counter trend move up, I was shorting here. But what has happened so much in the last month or so is that the market just bulldozed higher uh, because it's a very strong bull market, one that I'm struggling to believe in. Would you believe it? So looking at the next chart, what are you seeing now? What has happened now that also happened here? What has happened here is that the up here, the market closed above a prior bar's high. And here, we have closed below a prior bar's low in a downtrend, which to me suggests that this is an opportunity to sell short right here in what I call market on closed sell order. You're waiting for the bar to complete. And if there's no discernible uh, tail in the market, uh, on the sorry, if there's no discernible tail, on the candle or the bar, whatever you use. Um, I don't mind whether you use a candle chart or a bar chart, it doesn't make any difference to me. Same information, uh, just the candles perhaps are a little easier on the eye than, than bar charts are. This would be a sell signal for me. Are you ready for the next one? So what I want to discuss with you is what scenario weighs the highest here? What risk is associated with each scenario? So there's this, there's the bearish scenario. There's the scenario where we are saying the market is in a downtrend. We just had a little counter trend and we're headed lower. But of course, there's also this idea here that, well, the market filled a gap, perhaps, and now we're headed up again. And this bit here is just a buy opportunity before we're headed even higher. So you can see that you can address this from both sides point of view and every chart is ambiguous. You will never have a debt cert chart. You need to accept that you will never have a debt cert situation. So if you're using this as your low and you want to be a buyer, well, then you're probably going to have this as your stop loss stop. And you're hoping that we're going to go up to the old high. Whilst if you are selling short here, well, you can have a stop loss here, you can have a stop loss here, you can have a stop loss anywhere in between. But, but let me tell you something about stop losses. Stop losses is simply just a reflection of the risk you want to take on board. So if you're selling short here, and you're having a stop loss here, your stop loss is going to be tiny, your risk is tiny. But your risk of being stopped out is big. If you have a stop loss up here, your risk is big, but the risk of being stopped out is tiny. Do you see that? This is simply just a, a, an equation between risk and reward. The bigger you make your stop loss, the smaller the risk of being stopped out. But if you are stopped out, much greater loss. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something that every single trader will need to embrace every single day. Because I tell you this, to believe that the perfect trading setup exists and that somehow it can be bought from a software package is just a blatant lie. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a sure thing. It doesn't matter whether it's GAN or Fibonacci or price action or trend lines or Bollinger Bands or MACD, RSI, stochastics. No such thing as the sure thing. That means that the sooner that you embrace that in order to be a profitable trader, you need to learn to lose well, the better. You will significantly shorten the learning journey and arrive at your profitable destination 
if you embrace the idea of taking losses. Larry Pesavento, he says it quite poetically, he says, take care of your losers because the winners, they'll take care of themselves. A colleague of ours in the industry, his name is Rodriguez, he worked for a FX broker. I think it was called FXCM, but you know, I could be wrong. They investigated 25,000 of their clients and over a 15 month period where these 25,000 clients had executed 43 million trades. Now, 43 million trades in the FX market, you know, Euro dollar, sterling dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen, Euro yen, and all, you know, all those pairs, but predominantly in Euro dollar. Now, I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to think about this. And whilst you're thinking about it, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Out of those 43 million trades, how many of those trades were winning trades? The percentage, please. You have 10 seconds to think about it. Cheers. I hope that you got an answer in mind now. The answer is 62% of all trades, 62 were winning trades, i.e. 38% of all trades were losing trades. So that's a pretty good hit rate, isn't it? Now, when they won, they won 48 pips on average. <clears throat> now I need you to once again, put your thinking cap on and, and answer this. How many points did they lose when they lost? You got an answer? Here we go. 62% of all trades were winning trades. When they won, they won on average 48 odd pips, but when they lost, they lost about 80 odd pips. Is that a winning strategy? No, it isn't. Even though you have more winning trades than losing trades. Now to me, ladies and gentlemen, that's normal behavior. What you're seeing right now on the screen, that's normal. That's a normal person trading more winning trades than losing trades, but when they're faced with a losing position, they are incapable emotionally to take a loss. Normal behavior conducts normal traditional technical analysis. They will study candlestick patterns and technical analysis, Murphy's, everything that we have been told to study. But it's simply just not enough. If this was enough, you wouldn't have a losing percentage of 90% of all people. You just wouldn't. So I want to engage in the, well, what's the not so normal behavior? And I think this is perhaps a good time just to throw the microphone back to the organizers of this web, sem uh, this web seminar and ask them, is everything okay? Are we on track? Am I okay to carry on talking? All perfect, Tom. All perfect. Thank perfect. you. Thank you so much. Yes, okay. Thank you. So let's talk about the not so normal behavior. I put this into a, a little format. The I like is this is the universe talking here. There's the action, there's the reason, and then there's the reaction. But I call this the subconscious reason. I'm letting my loss run. Why am I doing that? Well, I'm telling myself that it is because I'm hoping the market will turn around. But the real reason why I'm letting my loss run is because I want to avoid pain. Another thing is that I'm telling myself, well, this indicator ratio, fib, price action, etc., is telling me that the market is going to turn around soon. The real reason is I want to avoid pain. Or I'm taking my profits now. I'm telling myself, you can't go broke taking a profit. But the real reason is I want to avoid the pain of seeing some of my profits disappearing. Or it could be I'm taking my profits. I'm telling myself, if I take my profits now, I'll make up for the last three or four losing trades. So I'm back to break even for the day. The real reason is you want to avoid pain and you want to balance pain. You want to get back to feeling good about yourself. 
Another thing is, and this is what 99% of people do, is that when they're winning, instead of betting more, they're betting less. I'm winning, so I'm reducing my stake size. Uh, why? Well, I'm telling myself I want to take it easy now. The real reason is you want to avoid pain of losing the money that you have bet. Have you ever been confronted with a psychological experiment whereby uh, you're given the choice between two outcomes? So you could, for example, have, I'm going to give you $10,000 right here, right now, or we can play a game of heads and tails. Heads, you get $20,000. Tails, you get nothing. The vast majority of people who are confronted with this experiment will say, I will take the, uh, I will take the certain $10,000. But now when you flip the experiment around and you say, hey, you owe me $10,000, but I'll let you play for it. Heads or tails, heads, you owe me nothing. Tails, you owe me $20,000. A disproportionate amount of people would game you for the loss i.e. they would take the certain profitable position, but they would gamble to reduce their loss. It seems that human beings tend to become risk averse when we want to uh, take a certain profit or certain outcome, but we become far more risk inviting when we want to avoid the pain of having to say, take a loss or paying back someone who we owe $10,000. And this is taken from an area of psychology called behavioral psychology. It wasn't necessarily reflected to trading as such. It was mere a, a, an, an illuminating experiment how human beings tend to act in its own, uh, in, in its purportedly wanted to act in his own best interest, but in reality is doing exactly the opposite. Why are they doing that? Because they want to avoid the certain pain and they would embrace the uncertain pain. Maybe this is explains why 90% of everyone is losing money trading. If you want to have a fantastic insight into the mind of a trader, I recommend that you get hold of this book here. It's written by Wiley, or published by Wiley, written by Fallon, uh, William D. Fallon. It's about a legendary bond trader called Charlie D. You can even find a YouTube uh, video with him but from the late 80s, early 90s, where he's giving a talk about trading. In his biography uh, by Fallon, Charlie D says, the time you know you become a good trader is that first day you were able to win by holding on and adding to a winning position. And there's many people in here, and he's talking about in this group of uh, floor traders that he's addressing at the time. There are many people in here in the pit that have traded for a long time and who have never added to a winning position. And that is, unfortunately, the, the, the nature of the human condition. We want to cut our winnings. We want to bring home the harvest. So if I bought a six and I can get out a seven, get me out. But I'm not so quick if, the, if I bought a six and the market goes five and four, because then one of the, 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 the differentiating conditions between animals and human beings is that we have hope. We hope that we're somehow going to get out of this. That's human nature. It's human nature to ride the losses. But when you are a good futures trader, everything you do hurts. Everything you do becomes uncomfortable when you are a good trader. So you got to fight your inert humanness unless there are reason to do what you want to do based on what you see in the market. So I want to repeat that. When you're a good trader, everything you do hurts. Everything you do feels uncomfortable. It feels uncomfortable to buy a storming rally up the page. It feels uncomfortable to go short a market that has already fallen. It's so much more appealing to buy something that's fallen because 
it feels a little bit like I'm going down to the supermarket on a Saturday morning and I see that the price of beef fillet or, or, or milk or butter has fallen in price and who wouldn't, want, who wouldn't want to buy butter at half price? Unless, of course, you're vegan. So people tend to be fearful when they should be hopeful. And people tend to be hopeful when they should be fearful. They, they've got it the wrong way around. And part of my warm-up process for any given trading day is to make sure that my mind is straight. When I do that, that, that contemplation and the, the, the warm-up practice, I trade so much better than when I just go in cold and I've just looked at charts. So let's go back to the, the scenario here. Which one weighs the highest here? And what risk is associated with each scenario? Well, we already answered that. We already discussed the having a stop loss down here or having a stop loss here, depending on whether you're long or short. And my argument from a price action point of view is that this was a counter trend in a downward trend, and I need to sell short here the moment this bar closes here. So let's get some more information. Price action is meant to help us understand what's going on. So the back, uh, so the box to the right is an hatch snapshot of the last seven bars. So what you're seeing here, I've highlighted over here. What are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing the market attempt to get above a prior bars high. But the moment we got up there, the limit sellers immediately stepped in. This is something that I use ex extensively when I'm scalping. I will observe a five minute bar. And the moment a market gets above a prior bars high, depending on trend or prior bars low, depending on trend, I will do the opposite. So I would sell short here, I would buy here, but that's from a scalping point of view. What we're doing here is we are day trading or precision trading. And whenever you see a market make this particular pattern where a bar is rejected above the high of a prior bar. This is a prior bar's high. When you see a market being rejected above here, you can be quite certain that the market at least will go down and test the area below. It's certain, but never complacent. Okay. Let me just see where we are. Here we are. So market goes down, makes a new low here. And now the very next bar, the market close above the high of the prior bar low. What would you do now? At this point, I got two scenarios to select from. I can buy a double bottom where the market has closed above the prior bar's high. Now that strategy has paid off before. Just trying to find it was here and here. So it looks like a double bottom. Risk is probably small because if I'm a buyer right here, I don't have to have a stop loss much further down than here. So my risk is really small. And I could probably look forward to a market going back up to the old highs. So this is my reward. This is my risk. That looks like a pretty good risk to reward ratio. And you also have the opportunity to add to your winning positions as the market confirms the trend higher. Or you can sell short. And if you sell short, it's because you're believing, well, this is just a trading, uh, a slight trading pause, but we're going to be headed lower. You will have a, a more difficult time if you're selling short here because you need to have a stop loss. Having a stop loss here is silly because it's too tight a stop loss. Then you can have a stop loss here, but that's almost the same as having a stop loss here. So really a meaningful stop loss needs to be above here or at a minimum above here. Why? Well, because this is a signal bar, a really a, a significant signal bar. And if the market can make its way back above an important bearish bar, well, it also means that whatever bearish forces has been absorbed by the bullish forces. 
So depending on stop, the odds of success is probably 60% for a short position, but you need to have a bigger stop loss and 40% for a bullish position, but with a tiny stop loss. Okay. My philosophy when I'm trading from a price action point of view is keep pressing the trend. How many, how many fortunes have been lost trying to catch a low? Now, if I was to catch a low, then let it at least be a low where there was a double bottom or a double top if I wanted to short. I'm going to continue for another eight minutes and then I'll take a break and we'll see where we are. Okay, Tom. Yeah, thank you. So uh, in this particular case here, the market once again closes below a prior bar's top, but we do have a risk of a double bottom here. It's probably a small risk because we closed quite negative, but let's see what happens. But before we do, let me give you an opportunity to assess the situation. Let me give you 10 seconds to figure out, well, what would you do here? Okay, sorry, I was just checking my positions. Following this new low down here, the market actually stages three bull bars. They're not particularly convincing bull bars. They're very small in, in, uh, in, in length. And they haven't so far managed to get above the, 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 the bear bar breakdown. So when a market has a, a fair degree of overlap bars within the context of a bull trend or bear trend, and the market makes a new high or new low, based on what we just see here, we've seen a new low. It's for me, one of those times when I would carry on pressing the short side of the market. I don't for one second believe that the market is about to turn around. Now I, I can read bars like you can as well. I can see that this is a fairly tight bear channel, but I don't believe that there's a reason to be bullish yet. And this is one of the things that I noticed many people at the brokerage get themselves into hot water over and over is that the moment there was just the slightest little bit of reprieve in a trend, being a bull trend or in this case, a bear trend, they would immediately interpret this as, whoa, the market is going to go back up again. But I don't believe that that's the case. Well, let's see. What would you do here? Let's see what happens. So what I feared would happen actually happened. The bulls actually managed to build on these three bull bars and is now pushing higher. With this in mind, if I was in a bear position, I would probably be somewhat concerned about what was going up, uh, on here depending on where my, my entry was. If I was not in a position, I would be thinking, well, hang on, we just managed to close above the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bars. We've managed to close above this congestion here. And this is actually the highest close that I can observe for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, some 13 bars. If I'm buying here, where would my stop loss be? Well, my stop loss could be either here, the risk of being stopped out are big, but my risk is small, or my stop loss could be here. If I'm selling short here, where would my stop loss be? Well, if I'm selling short here, I would have to have a stop loss up here. I would probably lean on the sh on the long side here, basis on this pattern here. So you will notice that I don't use any indicators, no moving averages, absolutely nothing. I simply just interpret bar by bar. I don't think that the trend has necessarily changed because the market seems to be that the downtrend seems to be lasting a lot longer than the short burst of the page. 
So for example, here we were going up one, two, three, four, four, five bars perhaps. Whilst we've been going down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen bars. Don't read too much into the fact that they were both 13 bars duration. It is common that downtrends uh, last for about 12 to 13 bars because it's equivalent to about an hour. I think maybe it has something to do with automated trading. I can't be certain. Okay. Have you decided what you're going to do now? There's the answer. So what I'm going to do now is I want to give you an opportunity to judge for yourself what you would do here. Some of you will have established a long position here. Some of you will with a stop loss down here. Some of you will have an established a short position perhaps with a stop loss up here. What would you do now? Here comes the next chart. What's significant about this bar here is that it closes below the low of an inside bar after the market failed to break out above a four bar congestion. What would you do? Would you buy with a stop loss? here or here or would you say well we're still in a downtrend to me i don't see anything in particular that makes me think that the downtrend has changed here comes the next chart So as, J, as a trader, our job, our job description is, you might as well to say, you are risk traders. You know, you, you need to take risk. How are you going to manage that risk? If I sell now, I could have a stop loss up here. In my observation, many people would be reluctant to sell something that has already gone down for nine or 10 bars. I think that's a mistake. I, I noticed this behavior in clients during my brokering days, that people were reluctant to sell something that had already fallen. They were also reluctant to buy something that had already risen for quite some time. What is about to happen is a real mind bender. Because what you're seeing is, I don't know if you noticed this, but this is about lunch hour in Europe. And the market settles into the most painful of congestion zones. Something that can be very boring to look at and difficult to deal with if you've got a big position going. And then the market breaks out. So I couldn't draw a straight line. So price action is not particularly helpful when market is in a congestion. You, you, I don't think that you can necessarily say, well, we closed above this one here or we, we closed below this one here because we are in a congestion. And every single one of these bars is pretty much the same length. So it's probably fair to say that we are simply just in a trading range and a pretty painful trading range of that as well. The market then attempts to break out. It's brilliant. It does that for three or four bars, but now we have an interesting bar. What's interesting about this bar here? Well, when you look at the size of this bar, there is a tail, much more of a tail than there was here, but this bar here, this bar here, this bar here, this bar here, and this bar here, and more so over here because it's in the early of the trading, it stands out because it's longer in length. So 
uh, I once read in a market wizard book, it was the interview with Paul Tudor Jones. He says that the market has been ranging and all of a sudden the market is you know, using with some force moving out of the congestion. You need to pay attention because this is a market trying to tell you something. And in this case here, a bar that is the longest bar that you've seen in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. In this case, quite a few bars. It's probably trying to tell us something. So what do we do? Well, let's evaluate risk. If I sell short here, my stop loss will be up here. If I want to be a buyer here, which is not something I would do here because it's a negative bar, I would probably have a, have a stop loss here, but more realistically down here because the odds of buying here and then being stopped out here are high. Might make for a low loss, but it will also make for really bad odds. Have you decided what you're going to do now? Okay, let's go to the next chart. The market carried on lower. So we actually took out this low. We took out this low here. So what does that tell you? What are you going to do now? You're going to press the lows. You're going to add to your winning trades. Have you closed your long position and you're going to flip short? Are you concerned about this low here? See what happened the last time we had this kind of length bar? So what I have attempted to do over the last hour is to combine trading psychology with price action. I don't use indicators because they're worthless to me. Everything I need, I can get from studying the naked chart. Now, we are on slide 61 out of 237 slides. So there's plenty of more to come. Let me just uh, finish this off. To me, this is a far more realistic way of training your eyes than it is just looking at the finished chart. Because if I gave you this chart about an hour ago, you would have said, yeah, I'm just going to sell short there because it's a 61% ratio or whatever it may be. Or, oh, I'm just going to buy this double bottom here or I'm going to sell this double top here. But here, by doing it bar by bar, you're forced to make connections in your mind, in your trading mind that you probably hadn't done before. And Take it from someone who trades very big stake size, where your concentration is, um, you know, I wish I could show you this, but I'm currently short about 50 odd contracts in the NASDAQ and I'm losing a fair bit of money because I'm still on the wrong side. But when you're trading big size, you are so much more focused. I mean, let me offer you an analogy. You're cruising down the motorway and you're doing um, 50 mile an hour. Well, when you're doing 50 mile an hour, not saying you should, but you can probably take a phone call or you can converse with uh, your fellow passenger and you can think about, ooh, what a nice weather it is. And, you know, give a little thought to your current life situation and what you're going to do this week and what's for dinner. But if you're not doing 50 miles an hour, but you're doing 100 miles an hour, you're a little bit more focused. Maybe you're a little reluctant to take a mobile phone call, etc. You shouldn't do it anyway. But if you're doing 150 miles an hour, I can pretty much guarantee you that you don't have time for anything else but the motorway straight ahead of you. And that's really where you want to be in trading. You don't want to be trading in a size that doesn't mean anything to you. I'm not saying you should get reckless, but you do need to push your trading size up to the point where you are fully focused and concentrated. Because if you're not, the results are going to be uh, thereafter. All right. This is transmissions. I have obviously many, many more examples. Let me just make a note that we are on slide 66. The next presentation I have is after this little, I have a shorter example in the DAX, is scalping. But what I suggest, and this is for the benefit of your viewers, is that perhaps we should do this next week. The, the scalping presentation is really long and it goes into all the different statistics that I use for scalping and the different kind of orders that I use for scalping. 
it's a very, very long stretch. And everything I've just flicked through now, I'm still only on slide 140. And then we come to patterns for the day and the week where I go through various different uh, scenarios under certain uh, days, again, in stock indices, such as the one when Friday is lower than Thursday, then Monday will have a very high odds of being lower than Friday's low. So all of this is uh, yet to come. So I think I would, oh, I would probably say um, that perhaps it's the, that time where we make a note of how far we got. And if you are still interested in this and you think that I haven't bored your ears off, and you haven't left the screen already, then we could continue this uh, next week. It would be the greatest, my greatest of pleasure. But I think I'll leave that to the moderators and uh, take their guidance. Yes, Tom, perfect, yeah? Uh, because, you know, it's long and obviously you know me and uh, I know you very well. You can do as many sessions as you like and break it down into digestible pieces, yeah? No problem at all. I think it would be a good idea. And yeah, also, I have a bit of a headache today. I, I, I don't know why, but I think I, I exercised too hard yesterday and I, my neck is really painful. So it, it, oh. I would be very happy if we could continue this next week. And I it's think we, we're, given good, uh, we're given good content now for the last hour and a half. Yes, something for them to digest. And also, Tom, um, while you are here, and I think Uncle Larry is here, um, I was talking to quite a few and I mentioned, and I hope you don't mind me mentioning it, I wanted you to basically confirm that not all traders are traders and not all bookkeepers are books. For example, I gave them an example of uh, when you and Larry, Uncle Larry had, uh, after writing some expo or something with a gentleman, um, we won't give the name, uh, father of candlesticks brought it to the Western world. You ordered a meal and you asked him about an intraday pattern and he said, I don't trade. <laughs> It's a sad story, and yes, you're right. Okay. I don't want to be exposed yeah. myself to libel, so yeah. uh, I have to be careful what I say. But a very prominent uh, individual had written extensively about candlesticks. I think I can say that. And obviously, as a, a trader, Larry and I uh, were curious about certain aspects, and the individual simply said that that he wasn't engaged in, in, in trading. And to me, that felt wrong. I, I'm not saying, I, I use an analogy here, and that is that you can be a really good uh, coach for a football team, like Alex Ferguson. Alex Ferguson, he, uh, he was from your part of the world, isn't he, Sarif? Yes. Yeah. Now, he was an exquisite coach that led Manchester United to two decades of, of dominating football. But all, but Alex Ferguson, you know, he's a great football player, but he wasn't anywhere near as, as good as, say, some of the people that he was coaching, like David Beckham, uh, Roy Keane, uh, Ronaldo, etc. But you don't need to. You don't necessarily need to be a great football player to be a great coach. And I don't think that you need to be a great trader either to, to have something of value to give on to people. But as a as a bare minimum, trading shouldn't be an academic exercise because, look, a, a different kind of uh, analogy. There are many golfers in the world, and there's many golfers who are what we call scratch golfers, meaning they can go through a golf course with past zero. But there's a very big difference to be potting for, uh, for the Augusta Championship over in California or you're just potting with a few friends on a weekend run around. And I, I believe that as traders, I wouldn't be able to stand, sit here and talk to you with the same kind of authority if I wasn't actually trading myself. And, you know, I don't mind saying that I had a losing month in January. I don't mind saying that right now I'm losing an absolute minor fortune in NASDAQ right now because I am. But I also know that every single loss that I've ever taken, every single profit that I've taken has taught me something. And I'm trying to pass that on. I don't try to glamorize trading. I'm not trying to 
portrayed into something it is not. Because I tell you this, it's a brutal business. It's brutal because it exposes all the frailties that we have in our psyche. So if you want a good place to do a little bit of, of self-evaluation, then come to the financial markets. They'll teach you a thing or two about yourself. That's what Larry always taught me. So it's so important that you constantly reflect, well, what am I bringing? Am I bringing my divorce? Am I bringing my argument with my girlfriend? Am I bringing fatigue? Am I bringing over-enthusiasm? What am I bringing to the equation? Because any old fool can read a chart. True, true. And the other question I wanted to ask regarding books, yeah? yeah. Um, um, Tom, I hope you don't obviously don't mind me asking again <laughs> and letting folks know. For example, um, we say, uh, they call it the Bible of uh, trading, Magi. Yeah. Am I right in that uh, they were journalists, uh, Tom? Yes, you're right. What? Edwards and McGee were, I think it was, I think it was Edwards who was, he was the cousin of Richard Scharbacher. Okay. And I don't know who told you this. I don't even know who, who told me this. Maybe it was Tepid too. But yes, Tepid, and, William Blunt. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that Edwards and McGee didn't do a good job of bringing technical analysis to the, to the, to the world. But it's also in, incredibly uh, uh, st 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 sterilized way of, of, of arguing that trend lines will always work or moving averages will always work. I think it's far better suited for investors than for day traders. I think day traders, we are dealing with an entire different beast. And so much of what we are doing today is competing with automated trading. And we have to be ever mindful of that. That means that we can never rest on our laurels, ever. And it can be incredibly humbling to be a trader because, you know, just when you think you sussed it, <laughs> the market throws you a curveball and you're starting all over. True, true. Same like uh, that LTCM, they got the Nobel laureates and oh, uh, no. they run it into the ground, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Is Larry still with us? Um, Uncle Larry. Larry's mic is on, um, but I don't know. Uncle Larry, are you here? Um, no. Uh, it's probably not. Anyway, no. Uh, I don't do many seminars or web seminars, so uh, you kind of got me out of my uh, inertia. I want to thank you for that. I would no, look forward no, to no, do something for you. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And, you know, saying all your, um, those time of days, seminars I attended and really we had good fun. Yes. The good old days. The good old days. Yes. Well, uh, it's still good old days, my friend. Yeah, this course, is, uh, we're, a little, we're a little older, a little wiser, but it's still good days. Older and bolder. Yes, indeed. <laughs> B A L D E R, not B O L. Yeah. <laughs> no, great, great, great. Yeah. So yeah, we will do again. And uh, I also asked all the uh, all the folks as well to send uh, the list they can do is send a honest uh, feedback testimony, and I will collect it all for you, Tom, and I will make it into a PDF and send to you as well. So. Very kind of you. Yeah, because no, it's uh, the list uh, they could do because you've taken time of uh, live running market and uh, I know the size. Oh, no, I've, I've been trading, yeah. I've just been yeah. losing. No, <laughs> but, but I'm, I know I'm losing that. in style, you know. No, but Tom, the best be a good loser kind of thing. But I know the size that you trade from past years and uh, enough to drop down a herd of elephants. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I need I need good deodorant at times. <laughs> you know the Chinese proverb um, about financial trading. Um, if you eat like a like a bird, you cannot. Um, sorry to use this word, shit like an elephant. <laughs> but um, really, it can make a bird do a, do an elephant one. You know. <laughs> you know. Um, I, I wanna. I wanna. Can I show you something? Sure. 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 Okay. One second. I just need to grab something. Okay. One okay. sec. Because this is what I wanna show you. One sec. <laughs> So um, this this book here, can you see it? Um, yeah, I can't read it though. No, it's okay. It's not so much the book. It's written by Larry Pesavento. 
And, oh, okay. and Larry gave me this book. It's called Profitable Patterns for Stock Trading. But okay. it's not so much the book that is is why I, if I am, I'm holding on to this so dearly. It is what he wrote inside the book. And I'd like to read it to you. Please. If you want to sail big ships, you must venture out where the water is deep. To me, that just set in motion the idea that if I ever wanted to trade big, I have got to take on the risk. You can't have one without the other. So I'm forever grateful for Larry for writing that. If you want to be great, you got to get out there where the water is deep. Thank you so much. Okay, so... I will hang up now. I'll stop sharing. Take care, guys. Okay. Good luck Thank with your trading. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really well and truly appreciated. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. So folks, I hope you all enjoyed this. Um, Tom and Uncle Larry, you know, top class. And I know Uncle Larry doesn't like me to call him a legend, but they are legend of legends. Legend, legends are made from, from them. <laughs>